everyone. Thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out and join us for our 1030 service. But if you can't, you can always watch us online at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can watch any of our past messages, see any of our upcoming events, or read pastor's blogs. Also, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media platforms right here. And now, here's this week's message. Isn't it great just to come together with like-minded, like-hearted people who really do desire to know the heart of Jesus? Just a great, great place um, to experience His presence. So thank you for being such a, a warm, loving family. I am very, very thankful for our church family, aren't you? I appreciate you all. <laughs> All right, I told you I'd give it to you. <laughs> Bribes go a long way. Um, I, I want to mention I'm wearing one of our reminder bracelets <clears throat> so I don't I want to say it now so I don't forget um, but this week our youth are going to camp and we want to be reminded over the course of the week just to pray over them and we're believing for them to encounter God in a powerful and profound way so as you go out today if you look just left uh, out those doors you'll see the the table there the connect center and um There'll be these green bracelets. Pick one up, put it on, and all week long as you think of it, I usually am wearing it and just kind of touch it and say uh, the prayers that I pray over, uh, over the, the students that'll be there. So it's great. Um, wow, I, I really, uh, we're going to look at Psalms 133 as we continue in our uh, Bible study together in the book of Psalms really enjoying just what it means to go deeper in scripture together quite honestly um, I am learning more in this season of my faith and my relationship with the Lord than uh, I've ever learned it just seems to be this constant time of God opening and awakening so much um, and so I'm excited to share some of the things today that the Lord's been speaking to me out of this you know we're we're taking time just to walk through uh, the book of Psalms, 15 chapters at a time. And so this week has been Psalms 130 to 135. And this next week will be the final 15 chapters. If you're reading two a day, you'll get it conquered. So 135 to, to 150. And then uh, we'll, we'll pick that up next Sunday. But I felt like the Lord was speaking to me about um, today. I want to kind of prepare uh, an expectation maybe of what I was sensing. Number one, I want to really be cautious uh, that I'm just following his lead. I think that we coming together in church need to model what should become our lifestyle. How many of you know when you sense the grace of God in a relationship, in a conversation at work or in the neighborhood or whatever it may be in your context, when you sense the grace of God and then you lean into that conversation because you sense the grace there, then what you're doing is cooperating with a deeper conversation God's trying to have in that situation. And then other times when you sense the grace of God lifting and you just step away from that, uh, and that's what I'm trying to practice uh, in this type of setting as well, where I just, when I sense the grace of God, I want to pause, lean into that. Um, and if I feel there's a lifting of something I would have shared otherwise, I just want to pull away from that. And just all of us should just be not only uh, led by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, but keeping in step with the Spirit. And it's a beautiful, beautiful um, desire of the Lord for us to learn what that looks like. And how many of you know we're not going to get it right from time to time? <clears throat> so bear with me when I get it wrong and have grace for me and I'll have grace for you and we'll just all keep growing together in our relationship with the Lord. But the thing that I felt the Lord was saying to me in preparation for today was that he's going to really give me specific words to say as I'm speaking. But more than the words I'm going to say, I saw that there are just these pockets of treasures of revelation from heaven that 
may or may not even be something I remark or point to or say that he's going to download in different ways to different people at different times through the course of our time together. I think what we're about to experience um, and are in the middle of experiencing right now this morning is really the essence of what I'm about to talk about. And there is a supernatural release that happens when we gather together as the church. Um, how many of you have ever been frustrated with the church before? How many of you have ever been frustrated with preachers before? Um, and let me just say, how many of you want to be like Jesus? Well, then you're going to have to learn to love the church. Because he didn't give up on her. He doesn't give up on people like me that stand up here and, you know, bring the best we can. And then we realize, oh, man, I fell short again in that scenario or whatever that may be. We're just all on a journey trying to find our way. And I'm so thankful for the grace of God as we walk this out. So let's continue to be gracious and patient with each other. It's the essence of unity. And it's the point uh, of the morning. And so the Lord wants to reveal some things. I'm convinced of it. Uh, as, I, as I pray into this, even in preparation, I just want to point you to the reality um, in, a, in a bit, we're going to point to Ephesians 4 and this incredible text of Scripture. But the chapter prior, I would invite you um, to hit our blog and kind of read some of these things. But I, I wanna, I'm not necessarily going to preach into this. I just want to mention it and then pray into it a bit. In Ephesians 3, this is the text. And I, I, <clears throat> I don't know, it's been a couple of years ago. I just was speaking, and when I read this phrase, it was that moment where grace just began to abound. And it was just this statement that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, Ephesians 3.19. That is a radical statement. That is a mind-boggling statement. What is the fullness of God? Like that you know you're supposed to be filled with it, but not just you individually. This text reveals the unity of the body of Christ as the context where God pours out the fullness of what he desires to pour into our hearts and lives. The enemy wants people to get sideways with church because there is something supernatural that happens when we gather like this. If we can get over our frustration of what that might mean, uh, you know, with the stuff we have to deal with, with each other, uh, and, and conquer that, and like step beyond that and just love each other through it, there's something there that the Lord wants us to get that we might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of Christ. You'll never find that on your own. You'll never, if you get mad and get separated and spin off from other believers, I'm just fed up. I love God, but I hate church. I've seen all the billboards. I understand it. Uh, I feel the same way sometimes. All of us do. Okay, we get it. But if you spin off and get yourself in that isolated disposition of individuality, you will not experience what I'm talking about. You'll never be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You'll be justified in your frustration at times, but still, you've got to more than conquer that so that you can learn to experience. It's just, it's just not healthy for you to constantly be talking about what you're mad about or what you're against. The church needs to learn to be known by what we are for, not by what we are against. And if we do that, it will really begin to transform the overall atmosphere of the expression of the love of Christ. So may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, being rooted and grounded in love, knowing the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of of God. And it goes on and says, to him, verse 21, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Lord, we know that the enemy is sly and tricky, But we know that Jesus abounds in wisdom beyond our wildest imagination. And we can have discerning, listening, hearing hearts if we're willing to get over ourselves. We know that fights don't come from other people and their behaviors. Fights come from our own desires that battle within us. Your word says in James 4, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your 
desires that battle within you. So help us, Father, to grow in humility and maturity that we might abound in love as the body of Christ and experience this supernatural outpouring of your spirit in gatherings and moments like these. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So one of the things I learned as I looked into these 15 chapters, Psalms 130, I'm sorry, 120 to 135, um, Psalms 120 to 134 are actually a specifically designated grouping of songs. Psalms are songs. And 120 to 134 are known as, and this is really important for us, songs of ascent. These 14, 120 to 34, songs of ascent. And ascent, as in ascending, going higher. That, that's the idea. And it's just beautiful. And if you think about it, it's kind of what's going, well, it's very much what's going on. There are all these prophetic pictures that communicate spiritual realities in, in, that we read about in Scripture. But the, uh, the Jews would travel three times a year to Jerusalem for these main festivals. And it's interesting, but when you, when you look at this, Jerusalem is, is a city on a hill. So imagine all these people in all these places making their way to Jerusalem. What are they doing? They're ascending. They're climbing up a hill. Why are they going? Because they're hungry to be obedient to the Lord. They're hungry to grow in an interaction with God. They know these are moments where they're coming together to worship, where they're going to encounter God in a way that's significant for their lives and their legacy. And so these, these songs of ascent are actually songs they would sing when they together were ascending up the hill to go and worship the Lord. It's very powerful. And so if you'll go to our blog, destinyokc.com forward slash blog, I, I've given the themes of each of these chapters because I actually thought about speaking on this. The progression is fascinating of what each progression is. And when they were singing these songs of ascent as they're making their way up the hill to worship the Lord, it's a beautiful progression and expression of worship and something really deep that was being released. But this really is the idea of us coming together, ascending in our perspective to worship the Lord. We're lifting our hearts to worship the Lord. We're lifting our attention and our focus to worship the Lord. Uh, you know, I love that there are a, a variety of expressions in the church. You know, that it, like if, if somebody gave you a million dollars, like some people... Uh, I, would, I would suppose some people would just stand there and sit down and cry. Anybody, that would be you, that would be your response. I was thinking this during worship when I heard the other response, like you would jump up and down and you would go crazy because somebody just gave you a million dollars, right? Different expressions. I just want to say, I'm so thankful for the million dollar bouncers over here in the house. And when I hear you guys worshiping and I just think there's some people in the room who might not understand what you have come out of, I'm thankful for the depth of your freedom out of bondages, out of brokenness breaking free from, uh, from drugs and homelessness and all the things you've come out of? Come on, we ought to celebrate and lift up. Jesus is bringing transformed lives. So just calm down if somebody else's expression isn't the same as yours and value and appreciate the unity of the body of Christ. We shouldn't be all alike. Conformity is not the goal. Transformation in a space of unity, that is the heart and the goal. So this, again, everybody coming, traveling upward, ascending upward, coming to the worshipful experience with the Lord, that's the goal in all of these, these songs of ascent. Psalms 133 speaks of the supernatural blessing of God that's being poured out on these people as they're ascending up the hill to encounter God in a powerful way. So just 
think about all these people walking together in unity up the hill, singing this song and how significant it is. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It's very important that we understand his robe, his garment gets a mention in this expression of unity. Verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there, where? This is unity. This is the place of our ascending and pressing in. We want to worship the Lord. Listen, before I read the last part of this verse, please understand this. You and I are not together in this room like just some practical gathering of people. We're not just a nonprofit gathering people together for some great community purpose. Great community action takes place as a result of our being here. There is something supernatural that happens when we, the church, understand our call to come together and actually be unified under the supernatural, eternal purposes of God. Because there, the Bible says, the Lord will command the blessing, life forevermore. We are right now ascending in our disposition toward a worshipful interaction with the Lord under the teaching and declaration and reading of his word. I've, I've said I'm sorry enough and repented over it over the course of time, and, and, and I really do believe the Lord has healed me of it and, and, and forgiven me for it and restored me, helped me mature beyond it. But I have just repented over and over for neglecting the importance of the reading of the Word of God. It's like I've tried to come up with the most clever, attractive, get people to church sermons, and I would use a verse and then preach my sermon on all these clever Google research, you know, just to keep everybody, I'm keeping the plates going, and, and hopefully everybody really likes the message, and they'll tell their friends, and then their friends will come, and we'll be able to have a bigger church. And, and the, the more I'm energized by the praises of man, the less I'm discerning to the heart of God, and I won't do it anymore. And I'm just, just learning as I'm going and learning as I'm growing. And I can't love you well if I'm trying to please you more than I'm trying to please the Lord. <laughs> Notice this dwelling in unity is both good and pleasant. He could have said good, he could have said pleasant, but he said both. Synonymous terms, and, and we, we want to make sure we take a look at that, but, but let's just recognize something is released when we gather together in this ascending nature of the pursuit of God dwelling together in unity and and listen Lord would you help us to hear the heart of Jesus in this text that Jesus obviously meditated on much when he walked on this planet there's something that you want us to walk away from today that's more than just, that was a nice message. But I believe today there are treasures you want to impart within us that actually will transform our behaviors, will dispel our hard-headed arguments that resist the nature of Christ and the kingdom of God. We just... Pause in this moment and just admit, Lord, we as the church, we've been evangelized by the world more than the world has been evangelized by us in many ways. And our independence and our isolation and our attitudes that don't reflect anything about your character, I pray you deal with those today. Deal with them deeply within us, Lord, at the deepest level that we might become more of the sons and daughters of God who understand the value of ascending together in spaces like this as a conviction and not a preference, not as a time we, when we can make it, we try to come together and casual about it. But, Father, may we learn what it is to truly live in a state of conviction about the things that matter to you. In Jesus' mighty name, 
Amen. The team that uh, we work with in England has been hosting these residentials. And um, we've, we've been involved over there for a long time. And, and it's really wonderful to have the entrance and to be involved in the conferences and the different things that we've been involved in. And some of those have been really like mass gatherings of people. And I think there's value to all of that. But what's happening is there's a shift in the residentials that we're hosting across England. And we're about to host our first one here in the U.S. in the month of July. It's where we stop trying to attract large crowds of people together. Uh, for the purpose of the residential. Not, uh, again, I'm not trying to dismiss something as wrong. I'm just saying we're growing in a greater understanding of the fullness of what God's desiring to reveal. And so what we're doing is we're gathering just key leaders that are, um, they lead various ministries, churches and different ministry expressions. Some of the individuals oversee nationwide movements. Um, but what we're doing is we're just gathering together in a space and we're not bringing in the dynamic proficiency, leadership, principle, best book lately written. Let's get everybody on board and excited because the big name person is there. We actually are focusing on the bigger name person, Jesus. And we're not focusing on trying to get you know somebody really well known to attract people. And we're just relationally connecting. And then we show up in these spaces, small groups. And um, small as in it could be anywhere from 20 to 60 uh, people. And over the course, we, like there's an arrival in an evening where we all get welcomed in. And then we spend the whole day the next day. We, this is overnight stuff. We're all in the same space, you know, sleeping in the same area, eating around tables together, identifying with each other on the deeper reality of God. Uh, there's not one key person that shows up carrying the, the strength of the message for everybody in that context. We just read scripture together. We might take time just to fast and pray or have communion as we're reading the word. We pray verses together. Uh, we, just, we just spend time just trying to draw closer to the Lord in a very intimate setting. And, and we do that that whole day. And then the next day as well, uh, that's kind of been the format of what we've done in the UK. And, and what has happened, this is just remarkable. And it's absolutely tied to what I'm talking to you about. Because what is happening is these churches that these individuals are leading, these ministries that God has entrusted to their care to steward, something is being transacted in their own heart in such a powerful way that these ministries are starting to shift and change, not because we've gotten together and talked about the proficiencies of watching the metrics and making sure you've got all your follow-up procedures, and not, not because of all the proficiency that we've learned to worship in the Western world church in this hour uh, of, of you know, leadership emphasis and uh, against some of that stuff is necessary in the church, so I'm not trying to just dispel it all, but it's not central. Jesus must be central. And when we're in these contexts and variables of just getting together in the Word, something in our hearts begins to change. Something in our lives begins to change. Something in the atmosphere that we carry begins to change. The preaching from the pulpit begins to change. The atmosphere of the hearts of believers begins to change. People begin to wake up to the reality of the kingdom of God, and something in the world begins to change. The body of Christ begins to walk in the anointing that I Isaiah 10, 27 says, destroys every yoke of bondage. Everywhere we go, we're bringing God's presence to real life. We're awakening something of God's kingdom in the earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And there is a, this is where you're going to have to, you're going to have to just submit to the Lord's desire in this. There is a deeper reality of the revelation we're talking about today in a smaller setting. I'm glad you're here, and I believe there's something significant and profound that happens when we gather like this shoulder to shoulder. But I'm just telling you, if you are not getting face to face with individuals in a smaller group setting, in a smaller, more intimate community setting, 
then you are missing something God desires for you to possess. And it's not only getting through to your life, it is not getting through to your legacy. This is important. I would invite you to pray over uh, the pastors and leaders that will be coming in in in, uh, July with us. We're just asking the Lord to really minister to all of our hearts that we might come from a deeper place of conviction in what the Lord's calling all of us to do. And like we've got an Airbnb that will host all of us. We're all going to go stay there. It'll be a miracle if we leave and we're not mad at each other. (laughs) It is easier to keep it clean. And just keep it in and out. And But no, we really want to grow in this. And I believe it's going to affect more and more the revelation of the table. And filtrating into the church. So we might understand how to walk this all out. So David describes these supernatural benefits. From dwelling together in unity. Supernatural benefits. How many of you know God's not just called us to be positive people. Moral people. He's called us to actually be supernatural people. Positive, morality, all those things are part of what this is, but that's not the primary. The primary is that we are actually so consumed with the Lord that his nature and his desires are beginning to be awakened within us. And uh, and, um, morality winds up just being obedience to the Lord in any given moment in time. And I want to grow in that. How about you? So the supernatural benefits are good and pleasant. These are synonymous terms that are used. Good implies morality that is actually supernaturally released in a place of unity. There is something within your heart that is impacted, that awakens the goodness of God whenever we're gathering together like this and we're ascending up the hill in the pursuit of what God's calling us to do. There's something released in your heart when we gather together in small group settings and we are ascending up the hill in a more intimate forum. Something of the goodness of God is awakened. But it also says pleasant. And that focuses on something of benefits. As I was looking at this, I thought it was just interesting. It, was, it, it really breaks it down as something that's awakened within us that is delightful, that is enjoyable, that is beneficial, that is beautiful. Ha, think about the Ark of the Covenant in the house of Obed-Edom. And, and you understand the Old Testament, like wherever the presence of God was, the blessing of God would begin to abound. Can you imagine what it would have been like if today we were taking turns keeping the Ark in someone's home and today you got selected and the Ark gets to go home with you? How many of you would be excited? How many of you would not reach up and touch it whenever you're carrying it? We've read the story. So they carry the ark into your house, and there it is in your house, and, 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 and you just have this sense of that which is delightful, enjoyable, beneficial, and beautiful because the joy that's being released in your heart is something supernatural from heaven. You are the carrier of the presence of God. You don't need an ark in your house. Every one of you are the ark of God. This is who we are. And when we gather in this type of forum, there's something supernatural that activates God's presence in a way that it's not activated otherwise. How good, how pleasant it is for God's people to gather together, to dwell together. Not just get together, dwell. It's a deeper revelation of relationship. To dwell together in unity. This is not the same kind of relationship you're ever going to experience in your bowling league, in your basketball clubs, in your baseball clubs, in your volleyball clubs. You're not ever going to experience what I'm talking about in those. And if you are having the same experience in those settings that you are here, then you aren't understanding what you're supposed to be doing here. There is something more that God is desiring to awaken within the body of Christ. We are not just trying to get people here. now, not trying to grow an empire. Not trying to collect people in a room. We want to make disciples. 
true Jesus followers who live in a world that is overcommitted and underconnected, but they refuse to live in the barrenness of a busy life, and they're choosing to move beyond that which is inconvenient because of a conviction that exists within them, and we are going to grow together as the body of Christ. I'll drink to that. <laughs> Verse 2. <laughs> That's just funny right there. <laughs> it is like the precious oil upon the head. It all begins with the head. Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. The oil was poured out on Christ and then began to come down on the body. That's the picture we're seeing in this. The precious oil poured upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robe. Now, Jesus, you remember when Jesus was crucified and they actually were gambling over his garment at the foot of the cross. And it was because it was this idea of a seamless garment, a robe, that the priests wore all the way back to Aaron the priest. All the way back. Jesus wore this robe himself as a rabbi and as the true priest who came uh, to fulfill all those prophecies. Amazing. He wore this seamless garment. So just try and get the picture of this for a moment. It's a garment without seam. So you kind of have the idea. It starts, because I was thinking about this, like how do you make a how do you make a garment without a seam? And it's, you kind of have to start like in the form of a poncho. <laughs> like it's one piece of, of fabric. Nothing is sewn together. The idea is there is no, uh, no fabric or fabricated connection that's not authentically one. This is the garment that the oil comes down on. You and I are clothed in Christ. We become literally the garment, the expression of the body of Christ in the earth, in the world in which we live. We have no fabricated seam. We are the family of God. He is our Father. We're brothers and sisters. That's legit. That's not just religious church language. That's legitimately the reality that supernaturally happens when we are grafted in to become sons and daughters of God. We become one. And the oil pours down on the oneness, the unity of the body of Christ. The Bible's just filled with prophetic pictures of these spiritual realities, and it's just so amazing. But that anointing released on the oneness and the unity of the body of Christ, listen carefully, it creates a mighty force field against the enemy that he cannot penetrate. And he hates it. And that's why he wants to get you mad at somebody over something they said, over something they did, over something they didn't do, over something they didn't say. Because the enemy is trying to create a tear in the fabric. So the oil will be spilled and not get to the intended recipients that God desires for that, that anointing to get to. Unity is the result of spiritual maturity. Maturity. Do you understand that? Unity doesn't come cheap. How many of you have ever been offended before? How many of you are going to be offended again? Jesus said, it is impossible that offenses shall not come. I one time said, how many of you have been offended by me? I'm not going to ask that question. It was too overwhelming. <laughs> I was offended. <laughs> but unity is the result of spiritual maturity. It's the willingness to cover somebody else's insecurity or somebody else's immaturity. And I cover that by being mature enough and humble enough and broken enough and dead enough 
not to give a reaction that perpetuates the hate or the frustration or the tension or whatever it is. The Bible says we're to bless those who curse us, pray for those who mistreat us, or in other words, be selflessly devoted to releasing God's kingdom in the earth by giving yourself to pursuing unity even at the cost of your own right to be right. Unity is the result of spiritual maturity and mature believers. How many of you are mature believers? Raise your hand if you're mature. I want to just see. How many of you are proud of how mature you are? Raise your hand if you're proud of it. There are a lot of mature believers here. You're, you're, you're being cautious because you don't want me to trick you. There's a lot of maturity. And I... I, in all sincerity, want to thank you for your spiritual maturity as a church. We do work with a lot of pastors. I do see a lot of chaos going on in churches. I don't see that here. And that's because of you, and I am thankful. When we get sideways, somehow we graciously work that out and stay unified and connected. We, I, I mean, I'm not even knocking on wood on this thing. I'm just saying, we've not had a church split. I've been the pastor for 34 years. We've never had a church split where this congregation side does it. We're going to be the hand lifters. We're going to be the hand not lifters. I mean, just the craziness. We can have distinction without having to have division because we are the unified body of Christ. And mature believers refuse to sacrifice this sacred atmosphere of unity where the blessing of life from God is being released, even when it requires absorbing insecurities and immaturities of others. So, how many of you want to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of Christ? Oh, isn't it? I, I, I'm just so inspired. <laughs> I'm so inspired by this reality. Filled to the measure. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. We're just going to take a little time in worship and just let him fill us up fresh and new. Give all of us an opportunity just to repent for any space, any place that we have allowed ourselves to be offended. Recognizing that The enemy's looking for anybody that will allow an open doorway of offense to create uh, some breakdown in what God's desiring to reveal. And I want you to see this final verse of Scripture out of Ephesians 4. Remember, it was Ephesians 3. It speaks of our being together as the body of Christ. And in that unity as the body, in our congregational family revelation, we are filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then we see it again reiterated in the very next chapter, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Now, these are this is the description of the five-fold ministry gifts for the body of Christ. That's what this is. We read in the book of Romans the uh, motivational gifts. Um, uh, I've, we're going to actually, Christmas is going to be an emphasis of the gift. And we're going to take some time prior to Christmas for many weeks. And we're going to explore the gifts And we're going to learn about the gift and the gift giver and all of the gifts God desires for us to possess. So just begin to prepare your heart in that regard. In the conclusion of the year, we're going to walk in a greater power of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit will certainly be part of the gift's emphasis. We're going to learn about these ministry gifts. We're going to learn about motivational gifts in the book of Romans. And we're going to learn about manifestation gifts in the book of uh, Corinthians. And so these are important. They're for the church church and we need to walk in this reality so God gave these five ministry gifts verse 12 to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up here it is until we all reach unity in the faith that's why he's 
release these gifts to awaken something of unity, that the Spirit of God might be poured out, that you and I might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And he reiterates that very concept, that, that we, all reach, we all might reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What is this? Whatever it is, I want it. I want more. But it doesn't come cheap. And it requires a deeper relationship. So evaluate. Have you been living an offended life? Think, think about you know, God's plan really is for us to discover the beautiful complexities of friendship and relationships in general in this attitude of love and mutual submission. That's quite a mess. If you need to get to the bathroom, you can do that. You don't have to. See, there's an opportunity for offense right there. In all seriousness, it is. The enemy will use anything. And like, just in, even in a sincere effort just to kind of lighten you know, everybody's attention going over there. I'm just, that could become an offense to someone. Can we just really bear our hearts to the Lord? Would you, would you just close your eyes and open your hearts? The psalmist writes in Psalms 139, which is actually part of what we're, we'll be reading this next week. He said, Lord, you know me. You know my thoughts before I think them. You know my words before they ever formulate or come out of my mouth. And then he goes on in the chapter and says, search me, Lord, know my heart. <laughs> like he's already admitted, God, you know everything about me before I even know it about me. And then he says, Lord, search me. And he's not saying, search me so that you will know me, because I obviously know you already know me. I'm saying, search me so that I can know me, that I can see. There are things that can happen within us that we don't even recognize and we're not able to see, and only the Lord can reveal those. So, Lord, would you search our hearts today? Would you search our hearts today that we might know if there be any way within us that needs to be addressed, that we would surrender that to you. And is he searching hearts right now, maybe revealing something? Just if he's revealing something specifically, God's putting his finger on something specifically that he's dealing with in your heart, just lift both your hands and surrender. Let's just give those things to him. Whatever they may be, whatever it may be that God is pointing out, we just surrender that to you, Lord. I pray you help us to grow in a greater revelation of maturity, in a deeper reality of unity as the body of Christ, that we might experience being the place, the people, where you yourself command blessing and life forevermore, filling us to the full measure of the very nature of Christ in Jesus mighty name in Jesus mighty name come on let's all stand to our feet I'm going to ask our prayer teams to come forward and we always just want to make room just to allow the Holy Spirit to solidify anything that he's stirring and awakening it's a great place to do it in this place of worship
But it's also great just in a prayer of agreement. And, and just listen, it's very important. I'm not here just to bring messages of positivity or, you know, challenge. Or I'm here to tell you that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us from our sin. And if you have not prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've not brought your sin to the cross of Christ, listen very carefully, then you are not a Christian. And it is very important that you understand this decision determines your eternal destination in, in forever. <laughs> like we need to hear about heaven and hell a little more frequently in the church that we might recognize this. But I also just want to say... and just a bit of a clue to what I'm sensing the Lord is saying and uh, over the course of the summer we're, we're going to take a look I want to be careful because this can be confusing but we have very much in our generation and I'll explain this we have made sal uh, salvation the kingdom of God that's a better way to say it we've made the kingdom of God the kingdom of a salvation prayer. And we're going to take a look at what decisional theology is. And, and let me just make sure we understand, you need to make a decision for Christ. It's great to say this on the heels of making sure you understand how I'm not changing that at all. But the kingdom of God is not the kingdom of salvation. It's the kingdom of God. And salvation is the entry point into walking in the fullness of the kingdom of God in the way we express our interaction with him. Jesus full of and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit, Luke chapter 4. Well, Lord, would you just um, seal this deal in our hearts with anything that you're stirring and awakening? I thank you for a church family where we're just not in a big rush to get through things and get out. But we want to make room because we're in this place of ascending in a very unique and special and supernatural way. You're pouring out your spirit, awakening something within us. And I pray, Lord, just even as we purpose a few more moments of just ascending in worship, we point our hearts and our affection, our attention to you. In Jesus' mighty name. Our prayer teams are available. If there's anything that we can pray with you about, anything about your family, anything about family members, anything about your own heart, your own life, something powerful about the prayer of agreement. Would you agree? So don't neglect that opportunity. If you sense the Lord prompting you, come and let us join in agreement with you over anything that the Lord may be stirring.